Uh, first of all, thanks to the organizers for inviting me. Uh, so uh, I'll talk about uh, something slightly different from uh, a lot of the topics discussed uh, here so far. I'll talk about uh, uh, matter in neutron stars. And there is a connection with uh, dark candles in the sense that neutron stars are objects you can't really see visibly. Uh, but uh, by looking at them in uh, radio and other wavelengths, you can get some information about matter uh, in situations where we don't know much about how it behaves. Uh, and that would be the uh, goal of this uh, experience. So uh, uh, some of you have not uh, thought about these things recently, so I'll start with a slightly broad overview of the QCD phase diagram. Uh, and uh, then I'll go on to the focus of this talk, which is uh, uh, the aspect of the phase diagram at high density and low temperatures. Uh, and there's an effective theory which is useful uh, to do com computations in this regime. Uh, uh, and I'll describe it. And uh, uh, I'll give an illustrative example of transport property we can compute for unpaired quark matter uh, uh, using these techniques. Uh, uh, and then uh, uh, I'll take into account interactions between quarks. In particular, uh, pairing plays an important role. And this changes the effective theory, theory dram dramatically. Uh, I'll show the effect of that and see how things are modified in different cases. OK, so uh, uh, usually when we talk about the QCT phase diagram, we uh, talk about studying it as a function of densities and te temperatures. So uh, this is the chemical potential axis. So going this way, you can think of as going to higher and higher densities or higher baryon densities. Um, and uh, uh, this axis is the temperature. So uh, going along this direction is increasing the temperature. And uh, we know a lot about uh, how QCD behaves when you increase the temperature. Uh, we know that at low temperatures, uh, you have a gas of ions. Uh, when you heat it, uh, you uh, uh, get a denser gas. And eventually, we expect that if the temperature is much, much larger than lambda QCD, you would enter a phase uh, where you don't have pions anymore. You have quarks and gluons. So that's the quark-gluon plasma. Uh, and uh, in fact, if the temperature is really, really high, uh, much higher than lambda QCD, then uh, we expect you can even do perturbative ca calculations because the uh, coupling constant runs. And at high energy, it is weaker. So uh, we expect things like, uh, uh, the chiral symmetry uh, or the chiral condensate becoming zero, uh, chiral symmetry being restored at very high temperatures, uh, in fact, even at lower temperatures. Uh, but you can do perturbative calculations higher at high, very high temperatures. And uh, uh, the tricky thing now is to see how you go from this phase we understand and this phase we kind of understand. Uh, in some, as you increase the temperature. And the re region where a sharp change occurs, it's a crossover we know now, uh, is not amenable to uh, uh, easy calculations. Uh, but uh, uh, lattice calculations done by various groups, including at TFR, uh, have given us a good understanding of what happens. You uh, increase the degrees of freedom uh, rapidly in this region, and uh, the chiral condensate drops to zero rapidly. Okay, so what uh, I'll focus on uh, is the other axis, uh, which is the high density region, uh, and uh, 
this is of interest because uh, at some density, uh, high density, low temperature matter is present in neutron star. Um, we know some things about this matter, this side of the diagram as well. If the chemical potential is very large, once again, the same arguments hold, asymptotic freedoms uh, could be invoked, and you can do, try to do perturbative calculation. And in fact, we know that at very high chemical potential, you have a phase of matter which is called color flavor log phase, which I'll talk, to, talk about a bit later. Uh, and then uh, at low uh, densities, you have a hadronic phase made up of protons, neutrons, some pions. Uh, so once again, the qu difficult question is, how do you go from here to here? And uh, as you'll see, on this axis, I put a number, but on this axis, I don't have any number. And uh, this region is difficult to compute. You can't uh, calculate things on, on the lattice in this region. Uh, and we don't quite know uh, where this transformation from hadronic matter to quark matter occurs. Uh, so, uh, so the philosophy will follow is that, uh, uh, well, let's say uh, 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 quark matter in neutron stars is described uh, closer to a picture which, uh, which is the asymptotically high chemical potential uh, picture. Uh, then you would say that, okay, it, there is some phase in neutron stars which is made up of quark matter, uh, weakly interacting, uh, nearly massless quarks because uh, the uh, chiral condensate has gone to zero, and interacting weakly via groups. Okay, so uh, uh, if this was all that was happening, we know quite well how to describe the system. Uh, from basic statistical physics, we know that uh, quarks will fill up energy levels up to some Fermi surface. And uh, if that is all that is there, that is, uh, there are only two scales in the problem. One, which is the temperature, uh, which is small, uh, and the chemical potential, then I have a two scale problem. Uh, and uh, uh, for two scale problems, uh, usually a good thing to try to approach them is write an effective theory which separates these scales out. So the expansion scales will be T upon mu, which will be a small number. Uh, just to keep in mind uh, some rough idea, uh, the temperatures are about uh, KeVs and the chemical potentials are hundreds of MeVs. So this ratio is indeed small. Uh, so in that case, quarks well below the Fermi surface, and also the anti-quarks can be completely integrated out. Uh, and the systematic way of doing this is called high density effective theory. And the idea is that instead of working with the full Lagrangian, uh, where I have put in the chemical potential, uh, you only take into account degrees of freedom uh, whose momenta are close to the chemical potential. So, uh, uh, this is a more standard picture, so you have some sort of a Fermi surface, and uh, uh, any momentum is close to the Fermi surface, so you break it down as uh, chemical potential times some velocity of magnitude one, uh, and uh, a small residue, so L is much, much smaller than the chemical potential. So L is governed by the temperature, so uh, in that case, you can simplify this to uh, a form which is uh, given here. And some people who, who work with high density effective theories might recognize this form, where instead of the mu, you have a heavy quark mass. And the idea is very, uh, very similar. You take out the fast moving mode and write the only uh, Lagrangian of the slow moving mode. V is the same velocity here, which tells you the position on the Fermi surface. Uh, and uh, as you can see, you get additional interaction terms. Uh, so for example, two gluon interaction terms. Okay.
uh, so uh, uh, the idea is kind of similar to Fermi liquid theory in condensed matter physics, but the formal structure is slightly different. Okay, so now you can uh, compute things here. So for example, you can uh, look at the polarization tensor of the gluons and uh, uh, since this is a finite density system, you have to uh, separate the longitudinal gluons and the transverse gluons, and this will play an important role. So uh, this is not just an academic thing. Uh, and the important thing to note here is that the polarization tensor for polarization for the longitudinal gluons has this structure that uh, at uh, small momenta, it goes to a finite value, uh, and which is large in our sense because the chemical potential is large. On the other hand, the transverse gluons uh, are Landau damped, uh, which is just a way of saying that uh, uh, in the limit of Q tending to zero, it does not go to a constant value, but there's a factor of Q naught upon Q. And what this means is that uh, Q naught is the energy uh, deviation from the Fermi surface. So uh, this is uh, of the order of the temperature, uh, while the momenta that are involved are of the order of the chemical potential. So this quantity is uh, much less than this quantity. Uh, what, and what this means is that the denominator is smaller, and hence transverse gluons uh, dominate, uh, transverse gluon exchange dominate uh, transport properties in this way. Okay, so once you have this, uh, you can calculate several things. Uh, uh, one interesting thing, uh, uh, one interesting calculation that's going on right now is calculating the equation of state. Um, uh, so I won't talk about it, but uh, it's of interest because uh, it determines the masses uh, of the neutron stars. Uh, what I'll focus on are dynamical or transport and you can get the main uh, aspects of these by just noting that all the degrees of freedom are close to the Fermi surface. So for example, uh, just because uh, you only excite fermions in a region T near the Fermi surface, the specific heat has to be just proportional to the temperature and uh, this is the behavior. Uh, uh, you can include operators for weak interactions in the effective theory and what you can do is uh, calculate the neutrino cooling rates. Um, so it has some specific uh, T6 behavior. Um, and uh, this actually has implications for the neutrino cooling of neutron stars. Uh, but okay, so I won't go into uh, discussing the details of that. I just wanted to mention it as one of the applications that you can use it for. Uh, the transport property that I'll focus on is the viscosity. So, uh, so shear viscosity uh, uh, is basically related to the force you get if there's fluid relative fluid motion between layers of a fluid. And uh, a rough kinetic theory expression for it is uh, viscosity is some density times momentum times some mean free time. Uh, so the density here is just uh, given by the cube, uh, cube of the chemical potential. Uh, the Fermi momentum is the same as the chemical potential. Uh, now, uh, the mean free uh, time uh, is inversely proportional to the cross section. Uh, and uh, here, uh, that simplification I talked about, that uh, uh, transverse gluon dominate at small temperature uh, helps, uh, helps us because then I can ignore the uh, longitudinal gluons and just calculate uh, these quantities uh, tau and eta using that. And uh, you get specific dependences on temperatures and the chemical potential. And once again, reminding you that uh, T upon mu is a small quantity. Uh, we see that this goes as roughly one upon, well, it goes as one upon T to the power of 
uh, minus one third, so uh, five thirds. So uh, you see that the viscosities and the mean free paths increase uh, as the temperature go to zero, goes to zero. Okay, and uh, similarly, one can calculate the uh, bulk viscosity. Um, uh, so shear viscosity, as I said, is related to friction when you have layers moving along uh, with relative motion. Bulk is related to what if you have a compression and expansion and uh, of a fluid. And uh, this is related to particle production due to a compression and expansion cycle. So for example, uh, during a compression, the weak equilibrium between U and D will be broken. And uh, uh, processes, uh, electroweak processes reestablish equilibrium, and uh, that gives you a viscosity. And it has a typical structure of this form. And once again, uh, uh, gamma is related to a relaxation time, a relaxation process rather, and it goes as D squared. Once again, based on the fact that you are governed by physics close to the center. Okay, so uh, for comparison, so this, these are results for quark matter. Uh, for comparison, uh, we want to see how things change if you have hadronic matter in neutron stars. And uh, these calculations were done a long time back, and uh, uh, there is some uh, specific behavior. At low temperatures, the shear viscosity dominates, and at high temperatures, the bulk viscosity. Okay, so uh, you have the ingredients. Now you, the question is, can you uh, have some observable which uh, distinguishes these two kinds of matter? And uh, 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 in neutron stars, uh, which I remind people are dense stars uh, with mass about two solar masses uh, and uh, radius about 10 to 15 kilometers, uh, you have a dense core, and possibly you could have either hadronic phase or uh, a quark matter phase. And the difference between these two phases could tell you uh, something over the, the phenomenological differences between the two phases could be observable for neutron stars. And the observable which is sensitive to viscosities uh, is called uh, R mode damping. Uh, so our modes are uh, fluid dynamical modes, uh, uh, which are uh, which are activated whenever you have a rotating body. So, uh, so uh, if you have an ideal fluid uh, on a spherical uh, uh, ideal fluid and you rotate it, then you have solutions uh, which are of this kind. Uh, some B of R, which depends on the radius, but depends uh, and have some specific uh, uh, angular momentum. And the uh, key point is that uh, if you couple these modes to gravity, uh, which is an important force in neutron stars, uh, these uh, modes become unstable. So uh, uh, coupling to them, uh, you'd uh, coupling these modes to gravity, you'd expect that they'll start damping out. Uh, gravitational waves will uh, uh, take out angular momentum. Uh, but what you see is that actually the amplitude of the mode increases. So this uh, tau gravitational radiation is actually negative. So what it means is the mode grows, uh, but uh, for an inertial observer, observer far away, uh, what, what one sees is both the angular momentum as well as the energy of the star decreases. So that's, uh, it's, it is a damping mode, but uh, what this implies is that uh, uh, the neutron star would lose its angular momentum at a very rapid rate um, uh, if this instability is. And we don't see this behavior, and the question is why not? And that's where the viscosity comes into play. Uh, uh, the fluid uh, 
has damping modes which are uh, shear viscosities and bulk viscosities. And as long as this sum, or this should be T, as long as this sum, one upon tau, one upon tau eta, one upon tau xi is positive, uh, you won't get a, get an exponential rise. If it's negative, then you do. Um, so, uh, so what does the data say? So this is uh, slightly busy, so I'll go through it a bit slowly. So uh, what these shows are uh, uh, neutron stars uh, with their temperatures measured. So for some of the neutron stars, the temperatures are uh, measured uh, well within certain range with some error. For some, some others in this region, you only have uh, upper bound. Okay, then. Yes. Okay, so what happens is that, uh, so if there is, if you create a slight perturbation to the perfect rotation, then uh, it starts growing and uh, no. So what happens is that the uh, uh, fluctuation in the velocity. So there's a background angular velocity and there's a small fluctuation on top of it. And that fluctuation keeps on increasing. And in fact, uh, uh, the, that fluctuation is coupled to gravitational waves because a proper rotation it does not couple to gravitational modes. So the fluctuation keeps on increasing, couples stronger to gravitational waves, and then the star starts to slow down. Viscosity prevents that. So if this instability is triggered, then uh, what would happen is the neutron star will slow down, the rotation will slow down rapidly, and then at some point uh, the, uh, so I didn't say this, so tau depends on the frequency. So if it's, uh, at some point the frequency will come below a critical frequency, and then it will stop slowing down. And we don't see any slowdown, so that means uh, 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 this mode is not being tri triggered in all the neutron stars that we know. Yeah, so viscosity is preventing it from being triggered. Exactly. That's uh, yes. It, it will be due to, and actually, I mean, uh, you can't, uh, the frequencies are such that you can't uh, use the present day detectors, but maybe future day detectors could be good. Uh, because we see these, these neutron stars, and uh, even within periods of one year, they are not slowing down so rapidly. They're, they're uh, uh, slowing down is uh, very slow and is basically related to magnetic damping. Exactly. That's, that's entirely possible, yeah. yeah. Exactly, so that is exactly the limit uh, that uh, we want to use to constrain the form of matter. And uh, uh, so this red, these red curves are for hadronic matter. Uh, and you can see that, so this, uh, this region above is the region where you have instability. Uh, so if, uh, uh, if this was the situation, if hadronic matter was all there is in neutron stars, then you would see that these, all these neutron stars would be uh, uh, slowing down very rapidly. But we don't see that, that means uh, uh, it's ruled, that picture is ruled out. Uh, uh, on the other hand, comparing to this blue curve, so this blue curve is for quark matter that I've described, uh, the calculation. And, uh, uh, okay, so there is uh, this uh, feature. This is coming due to uh, the bulk viscosity not having a monotonic behavior. And uh, uh, the upshot is that uh, uh, these are in the stability window. For, for the 
for interacting quark matter, uh, but not in the hadronic matter. So, uh, if I were to take this picture at face value, uh, what I would say is that uh, the observation of neutron star rotation is consistent with uh, having quark matter inside, uh, but not uh, purely hadronic matter. Um, So, yeah, so hyperons could change this picture definitely for, uh, so this is the simplest uh, situation with only protons and neutrons, yeah. But even hi having hyperons would be interesting in a different way, although it's difficult to make the hyperon picture consistent with uh, other observations uh, like the equation of Actually, no, so that's the thing, <laughs> it's not being, okay, so uh, it's a fair question about what parameters go into this calculation. So uh, uh, the things that you uh, have to put in are, well, there is a coupling constant that you have to put in, the uh, gluon, a quark gluon coupling constant. Uh, then, uh, uh, then you have to, you have an equation of state that you have to put in, but uh, let's say the equation of state is such that you have some uh, quark matter inside. Uh, then uh, there, is, there are no other parameters to put in. And uh, the coupling constant will definitely shift the curves. But uh, uh, now the question is, will it shift? Uh, if you vary it within a factor of two, either way, uh, you still seem to be in the okay region, but uh, there are definitely systematics that you have to study more carefully. Uh, the equation of state, okay, so as long as you assume that you have some quark matter, you take an equation of state which has a phase transition to quark matter, then this will happen. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, uh, there are a couple of caveats. Uh, so one caveat was uh, additional uh, kinds of uh, particles that you can put in the hadronic phase. Uh, there are other proposals to uh, get out of this problem. Uh, you could, uh, uh, neutron stars also have a, co uh, uh, have a crust and some friction between the interfaces of the crust and the core could give you additional damping. Uh, now, uh, uh, if, you, if you use very, very favorable assumptions for this interface, then you get this uh, yellow curve. And even then, you have a few, uh, well, you have two neutron stars which do, are not uh, in the stability window. Uh, but these are for very, very favorable assumptions. So, uh, I mean, this part of the story is ongoing and we'll see what happens, but uh, uh, it seems difficult to uh, get uh, uh, a stability using just this. Uh, and finally, there are other proposals where uh, some nonlinear effects uh, damp out uh, these reports. So, okay. So that I won't talk about, but uh, let's assume for now this sort of a story where unpaired quark matter is consistent with data, but uh, uh, hadronic matter is not. Uh, the issue is that you don't expect unpaired quark matter to be the ground state of matter at high density. Uh, the phase of matter you expect to be at high density uh, is uh, a phase with, uh, uh, with a condensate uh, of quarks. And uh, in particular, at very, very high densities, we know what this phase uh, uh, is. Uh, we know that uh, uh, it's a color flavor log phase where uh, quarks of different flavors, uh, because of this epsilon symbol, uh, pair with each other. So psi, let's say, up pairs with down. Uh, so alpha and beta are flavor indices, and ij are uh, uh, color indices. So different color, different flavors pair together in some 
symmetric scaling pattern, pattern like this. Um, and this pattern is the ground state if the chemical potential is so large that you can ignore the strange form mass. Um, and uh, there's a symmetry, nice symmetry breaking pattern for uh, due to this condensate. Uh, you can see if uh, you start with a theory which is SU3 color symmetric, uh, left right flavor symmetric, uh, and you get to a theory uh, with only a diagonal symmetry because if you rotate the epsilons together, that is still unbroken. Uh, so, uh, uh, so there is uh, there's a locking between color and flavor. If you uh, rotate color and flavor together, then the condensate does not change, but otherwise it changes. And uh, so uh, this L is an auxiliary index, uh, is summed over. Uh, so, uh, so alpha and beta are the flavor indices that you do, and then ij are color. So you, uh, one different way of writing which might make it a bit clearer is this epsilon can be written as del delta alpha i delta beta j minus delta alpha j. That means uh, i and alpha are locked together. So that's. No, so it's kind of an auxiliary index. And uh, uh, the uh, the different the big difference in the CFL phase compared to the to unpaired quark matter is that all fermionic uh, quasi particle excitations are gap due to pairing. So this we are familiar from uh, superconductivity in uh, metals that they, you need some energy to break a Cooper pair. Uh, so this energy is typically called delta. And the energy scales that you typically get are that delta is much, much greater than 10. So that success we had with the uh, viscosity data relied on the fact that uh, you could uh, excite fermions uh, because of this temperature. But if the gap in the fermionic spectrum is greater than the temperature, you can't do it. And uh, uh, in this hierarchy of scales, uh, the nature of the low energy effective theory completely changes. Uh, so, uh, uh, so the fermions just go away because of the exponential suppression, and they can be integrated out, and you get a theory uh, which is just governed by the Goldstone modes of the system. Uh, so, uh, this uh, SU L cross SU R. Uh, to SUL plus R is something that we are very familiar with from chiral symmetry breaking. This is what happens in vacuum also, assuming the strange quark mass is small. Uh, 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 there's an extra U1 here, though. Uh, there's a baryon number, which is also low. So, so the low energy effective theory is not HDEG. It's a theory only of uh, uh, this... Uh, U1 uh, baryon phase fluctuation, phi, and, uh, and pions, uh, some different kinds of pions, but still pions. Uh, and uh, we know the, uh, the form, low energy form of the Lagrangian very well is derivatives acting on this e to the power of i uh, phi. Uh, and, uh, uh, okay, and I can keep on writing higher order terms. And the suppression factor for higher order terms is once again temperature upon the chemical potential. Okay, so uh, so the question is what is uh, uh, what is the viscosity in this phase? And uh, uh, for this, I need to calculate. I need these coefficients uh, C1, C2, and sorry, C4, C3, and D5, etc. Uh, they can you can calculate them in weak coupling uh, pretty simply, uh, and uh, uh, okay. So maybe I'll uh, skip the details, and uh, 
uh, go to the conclusions for this particular phase. And the main point that comes out is that uh, because uh, Goldstone modes are always derivatively coupled, uh, uh, the matrix element, uh, okay, sorry, I should, this should be m square. So the matrix element square is always t to the power of four. Uh, so uh, low energy pions don't scatter with each other if there's no mass. So uh, the consequence of that is that uh, the mean free path of these pions is very, very large. Uh, so uh, if you have a very low energy pion, it can traverse all throughout the neutron star without getting scattered and uh, just uh, reach the other end of it. So then there's no notion of viscosity. It's just a free flow of pions. And uh, therefore, it does not give any damping. So this, uh, 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 this idea that we had that we'll have quark matter which will damp out uh, the R modes uh, does not uh, uh, quite work uh, in the case of the CFL matter. And the main point is that that's because of the fermions being completely capped. Uh, so uh, the main, con I just uh, write the main conclusion for the CFL phase, and then I'll talk about uh, one way of getting out of this issue uh, that we worked out. Uh, uh, the conclusion is that for the CFL phase, uh, uh, the CFL phase is inconsistent with the R mode uh, stability constraint. Uh, you get viscosities which are much, much Yeah, so, uh, so maybe I can go a bit more carefully. So, so there's color and then le left, left, right. And I'm assuming the chemical potential is so large that the strange quark mass is zero. So let's say this is a precise symmetry. And uh, uh, because of this uh, delta alpha, beta, delta ij business, you still, if you rotate color and flavor simultaneously, you still have a symmetry. So this is the pattern. And if I ignore the color, then it's exactly like what happens. Now, uh, the, the point is that uh, there's an effect of this color. When you put in the color, uh, uh, the, the gauge bosons that you have, uh, this, the color is a local symmetry. So then the gauge bosons will have a Meissner mass. Uh, so, uh, so you have to take that into account also. Uh, but uh, if you look at low energy dynamics, then they don't play a role because they, are, they all have a mass. So for low energy purposes, it's enough to just look at the good. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. So, so the idea is to, uh, 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 so it seems like it's in, the data is calling out for phases where you do have gapless modes and, of fermions. And uh, these actually occur naturally because uh, the strange quark mass that we neglected uh, is, is a good approximation if the chemical potential is very large. It's, uh, uh, let's say, uh, over uh, several thousands of MeV, then this is fine. But for realis realistic densities in neutron stars, uh, uh, you have to take it into account. And what uh, it does uh, is that uh, uh, the Fermi surfaces that were that are taken equal in size, uh, because uh, the chemical potential is just the same for all the quarks, uh, get split up. Uh, and uh, this is uh, very consequential for the CFL phase in particular, because in the CFL phase, uh, different flavors uh, uh, condense with each other. So U and D and so on, uh, U with S, etc., condense. Uh, so if you have a splitting between Fermi surfaces, uh, then you would uh, uh, put a stress on the pairing. And uh, uh, 
phases which are favored in some regions of the stress uh, uh, are called uh, FF phases, some technical name, but uh, they have an interesting property that uh, quarks of opposite momentum don't pair with each other, uh, but uh, there is some residual momentum. And uh, in position, okay. So in position space, uh, uh, this corresponds to condensates which uh, depend on position. And uh, you can think of this as some sort of a lattice of a condensate. And uh, uh, the intuitive idea why these kind of phases might be favored uh, are that this allows pairing on split Fermi surfaces. So if uh, momenta are opposite, then you can't find pairs of quarks, for example, a U, to pair with uh, a D with opposite momentum on the Fermi surface. But with the residual momentum, uh, you can have quarks on the D Fermi surface pairing with the quarks on the U Fermi surface, which is what we want. And uh, the key feature of this, which will be useful for us, is that uh, these have modes uh, which are gapless. So uh, the dispersion in this uh, uh, phase is kind of complicated, but uh, what one sees is that there are certain values of uh, angles for which the dispersion is gapless. Okay, so, uh, so maybe I'll move a bit faster. So uh, what I'll tell you basically is then you can write an effective theory describing this, low energy Lagrangian describing this phase. Uh, it also has some Goldstone modes, uh, and then uh, gluons and the fermions. And then uh, you can do the calculation of the viscosity, and I'll just show the main result here. Uh, so, uh, the result is that well, there are, I made two lines for the uh, unpaired. One is an analytic result and one is a numerical result. But uh, this result is for uh, the unpaired quark matter that I described before. And uh, this is the result that we obtain so as a function of temperature, the uh, shear viscosity uh, for uh, this uh, FF phase that I mentioned. And it is smaller compared to the unpaired quark matter, uh, but uh, it's a factor of uh, 100 smaller uh, uh, compared to the unpaired quark matter, but not exponentially suppressed. Uh, so now, if I go back to the diagram, this corresponds to the shear viscosity part of the uh, uh, phase, uh, of the uh, instability diagram, and uh, this corresponds to shifting the uh, left wall. Uh, to the left uh, by a factor of uh, 100. But uh, remember, this is, an, uh, this is a log scale. So OK. So uh, in our results, we still don't have anything to say about what happens here. And uh, we're still looking at, uh, we'll look later at the bulk viscosity. But so far, our results, is, uh, results say that the, for the shear viscosity, at least, uh, there's been a significant difference uh, between the FF phases and the unpaired quark matter. So that's basically our main result. And uh, 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 the main points I'd like to end are that, uh, uh, end with are that data on angular velocity suggests that you have gapless fermionic excitations, and there are phases which naturally have these. And uh, uh, it will be interesting once we have the full calculation to see if they're consistent. Yes, so at, uh, at chemical potentials which are very large compared to the strange quark mass, Specifically, if, it, if ms squared by mu is, great, is smaller than delta, then it is known that uh, CFL is the ground state. You can actually do a perturbative calculation, and uh, uh, that's known to be the most stable phase. Uh,
It's only in the intermediate regime when. No, so some core region. Uh, so actually, where are these locations of these? Yeah, that's a good question, actually. So uh, it has to be a substantial region in the core uh, because most of the damping does come for the, from the core, but uh, not at r equals to zero. It comes from, so the size of the core, let's say, is about uh, like seven. Yeah, no, the core is quite big, actually. So let's say, I mean, uh, if I say neutron star is about 12, 12 kilometers, then 10 kilometers is, is the core. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, uh, so then the question is how much of that core is actually uh, uh, quark matter? And, uh, okay, I've, I've not done a simulation to say that, but if, like, say, I would say 50, 70% of it is. So that's a high temperature phase. So that I think will have, a, uh, if the temperature is very large there, much larger than lambda QCD, then I think it will have a very good vis high viscosity automatically. Uh, No, so this is very specific to rotation. Uh, there, I think the flows themselves uh, create the gravitational waves. Uh, I don't know of any such analysis. Here, it's very, very.